So welcome everyone um, to today's lecture. Um, it's part of a lecture series called Crisis of Imagination, Registers of Loss, Pain, Hope and Climate Change in India. This is the second lecture in the series of what would lead to uh, four more lecture uh, and it would run up to the end of uh, early November. Um, um, I'm Rahul Ranjan. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow uh, here at the Oslo Metropolitan University. Um, I work for a project called Riverine Rights. Um, as a team, we investigate rights of nature, uh, specifically rights of rivers. Um, and I work on the intersection of political ecology, emotion, and climate change in India. This lecture series is co-organized with Shalini Ayangar who is a doctoral candidate at anthropology department uh, at the Yale University in the US. Uh, unfortunately, today she will not be able to attend the session because it's past midnight for her and she's defending her, defending her prospect, uh, PhD prospect. Um, uh, before I introduce this speaker today, I just want to lay out a few um, housekeeping rules. So there are two ways to ask questions. One is to have your question written down and put them into the ch chat box. Um, and I can have the question read for you at the end of the talk. And the second way is to use the emoji sign, raise your hand and I'll have you unmuted and you can ask your question yourself. And it would be best if you can have the question formulated um, before we run into Q&A session. Um, today, our speaker will speak about um, 50 minutes after which we will have a Q&A session for about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, in between, if you find anything that you need to know about the series or you want to follow up apart from Twitter, you can write to me on my email address that I'll put in the chat box and I can send you the links to you and you can circulate that furthermore in your, um, in your circle. Uh, and at no point should you fret that you would miss out or your colleagues will miss out because most of these talks um, are recorded and will be put online after the session as series has come to an end. This is a series uh, that is drawn on from the former series, which is which was called Perception of Environment, where we hosted about 12 lecture last fall. And at the end of this series, uh, we'll have all of these lectures combined together um, that can be used for, for any purposes of academic um, knowledge. Um, I'm extremely delighted on behalf of Shalini as well to have um, Dr. Ritodi Chakravarti with us today. Uh, so Dr. Ritodi was awarded his PhD in philosophy and geography uh, at University of Wisconsin-Madison and is currently a human, um, is a lecturer in the human geography department at the University of Canterbury, Aotearoa, New Zealand. He researches in and, and teaches um, in the field of critical radical feminist studies of nature society relationship and focuses on rural migrant masculinity in, in Himalaya. His theoretical interests include critical environmental justice, critical feminist studies of global environmental change, science and technology studies, critical development studies and youth studies from the majority world. His ongoing research project explores the functional and emancipatory value of indigenous cartography in landscape redesign with Aotearoa and the politics of climate adaptation across Himalaya. He actively pursues research that is boundary crossing between natural and social sciences, drawing on uh, plural epistemology and co-producing knowledge with indigenous and local communities. So welcome, Ritodi, and thank you so much again on behalf of uh, the whole series uh, to be here. It's really a privilege. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Rahul, and thank you so many uh, people showed up. I hope uh, I can say something of value to all of you. Um, to begin with, uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this, honestly. Looking at this lineup of uh, scholars, I feel quite starstruck and uh, I am in no way in the league that they are. And because, you know, I'm a, I call myself a reformed activist. I've been drawn kicking and screaming into academia. And so I'm not much of a scholar. I'm a lot more of a person who likes to work on the ground. Um, and uh, in terms of my talk today, you know, 
Uh, I am thinking I've been working at the intersections of uh, climate knowledge production, masculinity, and rural transformation um, for more than a decade now, right? Um, a lot of this work was done in a, I would say, a non-scholarly sense, right? It was done as part of NGOs, it was done as part of um, working for development agencies. Um, it was done part of volunteering, right? Um, so this is an attempt of mine to kind of think through some of these things, right, which are at the intersections of science and technology studies, it's at the intersections of environmental justice, it's at the intersections of anti-caste ways of thinking about environmentalism, it's at the intersections of understanding regionalism and rural transformation within, um, you know, within a new extractive development frontier, which is the Himalaya, right? Um, so having said that, uh, I'll also add another caveat, which is this whole talk is almost uh, like, it is sort of uh, me posing a question to myself and to all of you to get, to kind of gauge some kind of uh, like response to, you know, things which I'm completely not sure about, right? This frame of the Manthropocene, this idea that the Himalaya itself is a suitable category with which to understand some of these issues. These are all, you know, unsettled. Like there's a lot of unease within my own self when I think about these things, right? So none of this is set in stone. So I want to take this opportunity to tell you that this is more of a conversation, right? This is probably the beginning of the conversation where I am right now, where I'm trying to make sense of this this confluence of a variety of things that are meeting at one place, which I currently see being thought of very dissociatively, right? So having said that, um, uh, I'll continue. Uh, this is uh, the outline for the talk today. So why the Manthropocene, right? Um, a bit of an introduction, uh, looking at uh, climate society relationships, Uttarakhand, where I did this work, a bit of our methods and positionality. Then I'll kind of quickly go through, I would almost call it a, not really a lit review, but looking at some of the structural processes around caste, masculinity, and climate change, and then really get into what I hope can be today, which is sort of a storytelling session, right? As you'll notice, the, the talk today is quite, uh, I would call it quite skinny on, on theory, because the point is I want to tell you a story about some of the things that are happening uh, in Uttarakhand, which I've been witness to for almost 10 years, and get a sense of what all that means, right? Kind of together muddle through that process of how all of these very complex social ecological relationships are transforming over time, right? So what you'll notice is that this talk is more of me trying to take you with me on this journey and tell you a few stories about Uttarakhand. And hopefully at the end of it, um, you can <laughs> tell me the ways in which it doesn't quite work and or find places of intervention, which I can then hopefully take and make something better out of this, right? So the three vignettes, which are at the heart of it is where I'll try and spend most of my time, right? Vignette one, two, and three, which again, combine together those confluences of caste, masculinity, uh, ecological transformation, um, climate knowledge production, all of those you know, separate moving parts. So why the Manthropocene, right? Um, Haltman and Poole, uh, who've been working on this concept of the Manthropocene, which was talked about by a uh, journalist, Kate Rawert, who, who actually said that, look, the big issue here is that so much of knowledge production around climate change, as well as the problems being created, the Anthropocene itself is sort of a production of a very male, industrial hegemonical subjectivity, right? And this kind of a subjectivity is almost set as a binary towards this ethics of care, right? Towards this ethics of plurality, towards one which recognizes humans and non-humans on terms which are a lot more than just merely extractive, right? And so they kind of said, um, 
well, how do we then encounter the Manthropocene, right? If this is a Manthropocene, as Kate Raworth has said, when she was talking about IPCC authors, right? How can we encounter that? And their suggestion was this idea of ecological masculinities, right? They said, well, actually we have to step away from that industrial breadwinner masculinity, which they rooted in the global North, right? Along with whiteness, along with hegemonic masculinity of this you know, ultimate colonial man and who then transforms into the industrial man, right? And then goes to conquer the world. They sort of use that as uh, almost like a sounding block to then suggest that the way ahead is actually ecological masculinities, right? Now, uh, here's sort of like the full disclosure, right? I'm not 100% sure if ecological masculinities is a framework that actually works in South Asia. And I don't even know if it has any functional value um, when thinking about what is happening on the ground in some of these South Asian communities and ecologies. However, um, what I found very interesting is that, so, so these are, these are some of the problems which I see with it right, right off the bat, is that it's climate reductionist, right? So it sort of boils down or deconstructs or dismantles a whole bunch of stuff as climate change, right? So it inadvertently is a historic, it sort of wipes out so much of structural oppression, uh, be that racial, be that you know cost, be that gender. Even though they're not saying so, there, there is this overwhelming, almost a hegemonic sense that the climate crisis is the greatest crisis that humanity's ever faced, which itself is um, very questionable depending on who you ask, right? It has minority world roots and focus. It's heavily rooted in uh, the global north and the heavily industrial global north, right? So a lot of Scandinavian, Dutch kind of uh, sensibilities. And they stay at the nation scale, right? They're really kind of talking about um, the scale at which, you know, this national identity is somehow this chamber, which is percolating all these other masculinities somehow into this one idea of masculinity, right? Which itself is problematic. And yes, it is white middle-class environmentalism. And again, I I'm not gonna go into some of this just because this is not the point here. Um, and industrial masculinities and climate denial, right? Like this notion of climate denial being, I would almost call it juxtaposed with rurality or being juxtaposed with a certain kind of masculinity. There is just no parallel for this, right? In South Asia, like I worked with rural men for a long time. I have never, I've honestly, I have never encountered anybody who is a climate denier in the way that they're talking about it, right? Just because climate denial as a political position doesn't really have much currency, right, in, in South Asia, in a lot of these rural contexts. And finally, they're seeing, you know, climate change as this moment of rupture and catalysis, right? That it is this moment that should, in many ways, catalyze this global movement, right? This mobilization away from extractive ways of being to more empathetic and caring ways of being, right? And this is where, you know, a, a counterweight comes from people like Kyle White or uh, and other indigenous thinkers who have constantly said, right, that the apocalypse or thinking about climate change on, as an apocalypse is really not a useful way of constructing this idea, right? Just because indigenous communities and other local communities have lived through apocalypse. And this is not some, you know, distant future. It's actually a quite recent past. And then finally, this idea of ecological masculinities, which I'll, I'll talk about. And, you know, I, I put up this picture of Mukul Sharma's Cost of Nature, which is, I think, a useful juxtaposition to some of this conversation. And I'll go into some of that a little bit later on. Um, but for me, sort of the useful things is that it, it allows us to sh shine some kind of light on uh, these three intersections of scholarship as well as work that are emerging from the, the majority world, right, around cost environment, around South Asian masculinities, which are very different from the way, uh, let's say, masculinity is emerging in the global north. And then finally, radical and indigenous critiques of climate change knowledge production, right? So how are we 
producing knowledge? How are we thinking about uh, knowledge both within global climate conversations like the IPCC and local context as well, right? So, you know, does a sort of like, does a, you know, focus on masculinity and does a focus on men in particular allow us to visualize something which will be, which we can't if we are not focused on them, right? And, you know, sort of like thinking about this and then thinking about the, the fact um, that the, for, for even today across the world, when you're looking at the scientific establishment, establishment, men are still quite overarchingly dominant in the ways that they position themselves. Patriarchy is through and through one of the strongest processual forces we have in the production of knowledge, right? And we see that from the smallest lab to the biggest transnational, inter, you know, national collection of scholars or what have you. So there is no there is no dialogue when it comes to that. That is an actual reality. Patriarchy is quite prominent within the culture of science itself, right? Having said that, you know, some of the these are the four questions that I've been sort of grappling with, right? So how are caste masculinity and the techno-managerial state involved in the social ecological transformation of Dragon, right? So how are they kind of looking at this region and how are they thinking about changing or responding or um, in many ways, like, you know, like welding this region together with a variety of different uh, uh, narratives, the variety of different human and non-human beings. And then second, what role do the discourse and material manifestation of climate change play in this transformation, right? So there is a, mul you know, there's a multitude of processes at play in Uttarakhand and climate change is just one of them. And sort of understanding how climate change is enmeshed within this, within this processual menagerie, right, so to speak, is kind of key, right? Otherwise, we fall into the trap of climate reductionism, where we just, you know, come out and say, well, it's all climate change, which clearly it is not. And then what does a relational focus on men and masculinity reveal when exploring regional transformation, right? So there are, I mean, it's a small group, but there are people that have worked on the lives of men and on you know, masculine subjectivities, masculine politics in the Western Himalaya, in Uttarakhand. Um, and some of that work informs you know, what you'll hear today as well about the ways in which men themselves are changing, right? And then finally, is the Manthropocene a useful lens and framework in South Asia, right? As it has been, let's say, posited, rooted in a certain imaginary emerging from the minority world, emerging from this very stark cleavage between hegemonic masculinity and uh, this, this almost caring masculinities, which honestly I feel is such a artificial heuristic and in many ways, maybe a problematic uh, heuristic in its you know, own self. Anyway, we'll see if I end up uh, agreeing with that uh, statement. But so that's just a bit of an introduction. Um, so this is Uttarakhand, right? This is where I've done a lot of my work along with some other parts of India. Um, Uttarakhand is where I've spent many years working with, uh, uh, working with NGOs, working against high piracy, working with uh, development organizations, looking at things like payment for ecosystem services or uh, trying to understand how to get um, rural individuals engaged within the development process. Not all of which I'm proud of, honestly, because some of it I was young and naive and I thought, you know, this is the right thing to do. This is what we should do, help better people. I mean, um, you'll hear about it in the next slide. I carry tremendous privilege within me because of my caste position and because of my, uh, let's say, educational endowments, which I've had. And so I definitely had a bit of an upper caste burden, right? It's like, I have to go save these people um, because without me, how can they ever get saved? So definitely had a savior complex in me when I was younger. And a lot of my work was done through that lens. However, um, as I've grown older, as I've been, let's say, critiqued and honestly challenged by 
very powerful scholars, activists within the South Asian scene, many of whom are uh, from the, are not upper caste, many of whom are Adivasi. I've myself kind of seen how incredibly problematic some of the views I held were when I was working, uh, let's say, as part of NGOs that were going into some of these spaces. So my connection to Uttarakhand goes back a long way. And Uttarakhand is this little state um, sandwiched between uh, Tibet and Uttar Pradesh in India. And on the um, eastern side, uh, there's Nepal. On the western side, there's Himachal Pradesh, right? So it, it really is a very interesting location because of very possible geopolitical um, implications, but also uh, implications tied to understand, you know, ideas of sacred geography, which again, this is where uh, this slide goes, that what are some of the popular narratives, right, about Uttarakhand? Um, one narrative is this notion of male migration, right, that there's all these men that are leaving, right, there's these ghost villages. Um, as you see on this right, right hand side, fear, fear of attacks by leopards leaves Uttarakhand with 700 ghost villages. And this is actually from September 6th, which is kind of incredible to think that this is a headline um, in a country where I would literally say, what, uh, 300 kilometers from here, there are uh, malls with automatic toilets in it, right? And however, there are headlines that, like this that also come up in a place like that. And if you see right down here on the right side of that same picture, it says, watch farmers playing Sunny Dale's dialogue of lion roar to frighten leopards. So it's, it's, it's just, there's just so much going on here, um, which again, that's a very different talk and I don't want to give that today, but just to say that there is this sense that Uttarakhand is a very dangerous, fragile place, right? And as you see there, I have this thing there called disaster prone, right? And that disaster prone also extends to this notion of dangerous nature, this notion of the Himalayas as this dangerous, as a beautiful, sacred, dangerous place, right? Because there is also this idea of sacred geography, where there's so many um, sacred Hindu uh, traditional sites there, right, which are really tied to Brahmanical Hinduism, um, right from Kedarnath to Badrinath to all of these, the Chardham Yatra. So it's a, it, in, in many ways, it's sort of like ground zero for, uh, let's say, Hindu sacred geography. Um, there's also this big thing about tourism, right? And as South Asia heats up, more and more and more people look towards the hills during summers and during other parts of the year to spend their vacations. And Uttarakhand, what you can start driving from New Delhi and get there in five or six hours, which is the, you know, I think Mukteshwar is the closest place to see or touch snow um, from New Delhi. So it is close enough that there is a huge movement towards the hills. Um, and, and this tourism also kind of brings with it, brings with it a lot more unsavory stuff as well around, uh, let's say, land markets, which are cropping up now where rich people from the plains are just coming in and buying up big pieces of um, rural property and then opening resorts or turning it into commercial agriculture. Um, so this is, you know, these are, these are some of the ideas um, through which Uttarakhand is often expressed in the national and in many times regional media, right? Now, again, I'm not going to go into migration or ghost villages because that's something that I, I, I've written a lot about and I think a lot about and how problematic a, a headline like this is, which says 700 ghost villages and sort of that causal chain, right, that literally people are leaving because leopards are eating them. That is such a simplistic reductionist, such an insane thing to say. However, it is also... Uh, it, it also like plays right into the ways in which Plains India thinks about Pahar. Pahar is another way of talking, another word for Uttarakhand, right? So this is, you know, th these are the Himalayas, the Corbett Himalayas. This is like a dangerous place where you go and the leopard gets you when you've, you know, gone to pee at night. So there is, you know, there's a lot of exoticization and uh, going on here and, there is a certain consumption also happening with this media. But 
I don't want to spend more time here. Um, so where is some of this work coming from, right? So it's almost an eight year engagement with various families across five districts of Uttarakhand. Some of the work that you'll hear today, it emerges from you know, more than 500 interviews, hundreds of household surveys, uh, many, many intra-village meetings from Ban Panchayats to Pani Panchayats. And these interviews, you know, they're with people in the village, they're people in block offices, they're people in New Delhi, they're people in state offices. It's just all over the place, really. Um, travel ethnographies where I've traveled up and down and around the state with young men as they're moving around and young people, uh, honestly, as they are navigating and uh, in, in many ways, retracing and tracing these mobility uh, contours, right? The ways in which rural households move and are extended. And yeah, so today I'll talk about, I think, three villages. Um, but just, just to give you a sense that this is a very small glimpse into what I'm, you know, the, the amount of, I would say, conversation and dialogue and, and um, information that I'm drawing from. So positionality, and this is kind of key, right? Um, there is no other way of saying this. I couldn't have done this work if I was a lower caste man. I couldn't have done this work if I was an, you know, if I was a woman, right? Some of the conversations, some of the spaces I was in were incredibly problematic. They were incredibly toxic male spaces, right? A lot of my conversations with men happened in tekas, right? Which is literally where men drink in the evening. They're really, I often felt unsafe in those environments. They are very unsafe environments and can be, right? Everybody's drunk. There's a lot of things being said and unsaid. Um, and so I have incredible amounts of privilege that has allowed me to access some of these places, some of these spaces, and there is just no way of getting around that, right? The thing also is that I was educated in the US, right? And I bring with it a certain, a whole other level of class power, a whole other level of educational endowment, which again, it literally has never been an obstacle and always just been um, something that has opened doors for me has has been seen has honestly often worked to get gatekeepers to you know open their gates. So I have an incredible amount of of privilege which has allowed me to you know do this work and you know just putting that out there because for example what you hear today right production of knowledge which upper caste men are doing I am part of that. Right, I am part of that manthropocene. I am part of that caste patriarchy science. Let's say, uh, uh, like the triangle, right? Like the axis of that triple axis of caste patriarchy and science, which in many ways is incredibly hegemonic. And I completely understand that position. Um, and in many ways, I'm you know, I'm always trying to sort of find ways to then deconstruct that, dismantle that by working with people in a way that is a lot more collaborative than I was when I was 20, 21 years old, telling farmers that they should be doing Jevikethi, <laughs> knowing nothing about the fact, you know, that Jevikethi is literally nothing compared to what they're already doing. So just, you know, having that out there is very important. Some of access to some of this, these spaces are incredibly guarded. Um, also, Pahari versus Medani, right? So people from the mountains versus people from the plains. And there is this, uh, there is this cultural historical construct, right? Where people from the mountains, men from the mountains are seen as simple, uneducated, but they're also seen as, they're also constructed as being more honest, uh, more dependable, right? Versus people from the plains were seen, like men from the plains were seen as being fast and they're seen as being hustlers. And however, they're also seen as seen as being more civilized, right? So there is this dichotomy there and there is interesting ways in which this dichotomy plays out, right? So there are a whole bunch of Hindi words thrown in there, which uh, hopefully some most of you will understand. If you don't, please ask me um, as we go on. 
Uh, Pahar is Uttarakhand, Maidan is the Plains, Thakur is upper caste, GC, which is general category, upper caste, SC is lower caste, Haldwani, I don't know if it comes up, but it's, it's a fast growing city in the plains of Uttarakhand. So um, again, I'll kind of just very lightly touch upon these concepts to get to the story. Caste in Uttarakhand again has emerged in a very interesting way as all parts of India are like, there isn't this uh, overarching a framework of caste apart from uh, let, let's say that some of the stuff that's enshrined in the constitution or even in the state constitutions, right? Um, in Uttarakhand, there hasn't been this four division, right? Which you see in some parts of Plains India. Instead, you have Brahmins, you have Khasiyas, who are essentially Rajputs, and you have Domes, right? And Domes are this huge spectrum of lower caste individuals who have worked in many, in many ways for these upper caste uh, families for generations. Um, so there, there has been a whole bunch of mobilization that lower caste communities have done. A, a big one was the Dola Palki movement, which happens all throughout the 20th century, where, uh, again, the domes sort of, I would say, mobilize a variety of tools to push back against upper caste domination, right? Um, then there is this idea of state formation, right? Uttarakhand as a state literally exists because of caste anxieties, right? The state gets carved out of Uttar Pradesh because uh, Paharis realize that, you know, there is a whole bunch of jobs which will go away because of a certain kind of law that is being passed. And so to kind of avoid that kind of reservation, there is this huge, I mean, I'm not saying that's the only reason you have this, uh, this, this mobilization against having their own state, but a huge part of it is cost anxieties of the middle and the upper costs, right? So that is, you know, that has led to the formation of Uttarakhand as this very interesting space where in most villages, uh, 70, 80, 90% of the population is upper caste. And often the lower caste community is quite small. The other thing is immigrants, right? So there's been a, a there's been a few different ways in which immigrants have, uh, and here I talk about immigrants as uh, um, not immigrants with any power. Uh, so, so for example, the Indian state put a whole bunch of refugees post partition as well as post the Bangladeshi Liberation War in that Terai area, right? So. There's a huge community of uh, of Bengalis and of, uh, of of people coming over from you know the west in, in Punjab that now live in that Tarai area, right? And they've also given a certain kind of uh, makeup. They've kind of challenged the ways in which caste is thought about, right, within the state. And then finally, right, as you, as is evidenced across India, there is a a rising amount of violence, right? Just open violence, which used to be, uh, let's say, more uh, surreptitious, now is just open violence against uh, lower caste individuals perpetrated by upper caste people. And this comes from police data, which then shows you um, how much of it is actually not reported. So there's an actual rise. And if you look at certain kind of statistics, I mean, the police's own national statistics, Uttarakhand is among the top five states in India for increase in caste violence. The other uh, big process here is masculinity, right? And this is where I would say, th this is sort of like the black hole in Uttarakhand. And I would say across you know, most of South Asia, right? And especially across rural South Asia, there has been very little wor work done on looking at uh, masculinity in rural South Asia. And again, I'm not, I mean, there is a whole bunch of people now that are doing incredible work using feminist lenses and kind of looking at feminist studies of masculinity, which is very important and it is emerging. And I, I have learned a lot from those scholars and I do work in this space. So um, I would say there are these four big things, right, that emerge. One is migrant masculinity. And I did my dissertation on that. I've written a lot about essentially this idea of, of migration and mobility and men and how that is such a ubiquitous factor of Pahari life. 
The second thing is agrarian absence, right? And this is a, I have a, I have a lot of issues with this idea, right? Just because as you will see, despite, you know, their absence from, let's say, materially working the fields, men are actually very present in the agrarian calendar and the agrarian power structure, right? Then there's uh, work that um, Koskimaki has done uh, on the masculine ethos, right? Kind of looking at how there was this uh, essentially regional production of Uttarakhand as a region that is driven by these kind of public politics, right? Of who is a man and then who is a man based on your caste and your ethnic affiliations, right? So it's a, it's a very powerful thing and it's this emerging, um, I would say, a set of literature that really looks at how Uttarakhand as a region, right? Has been, at least in the 20th century, shaped by this very masculine ethos. And then finally, there is this, uh, kind of like a conjecture, uh, a bit of a, um, almost like a binary, but not really, which in many ways echoes some of the rural urban binaries that, you know, we are grappling with, you know, whether or not they're even real is a whole other question. But this 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 binary of Pahari and Medani, right? Who is a Pahari man? Who is a Medani man? And do these categories even make sense anymore, given the kind of perforation there is? given the kind of mobility there is, given the way that the rural household now extends across space and time. And then finally, you know, the, the other big factor here is, um, is climate change, right? And I've, you know, some of the work that I've done and, you know, others have done shows that there are precipitation regime shifts, right? Um, the westerly disturbances, which bring a lot of snow to Uttarakhand have been shown across a variety of uh, modeling scenarios to be slowing down, there is an, intent, there is an intensification of precipitation um, happening on certain parts of the state while other parts see it being in intensified in different parts of the year. So there is, the climate is changing. However, what is really kind of missing in the picture is any kind of granularity, right? given the kind of micro scale aberrations there are, right? In, in a mountain space, in a mountain place, there is very little understanding of how those differences actually engage with each other, right? Um, there is a significant lack of ground truthing, which, you know, kind of goes back to, I would say all of South Asia, where there is a very techno-managerial top-down way in which we are thinking about climate knowledge production, right? Where there is, very little, uh, I would say, convergence of knowledges of epistemologies coming together to create more holistic pictures of the Anthropocene. Right? There is there is this over dependence on remote sensing. There is this over dependence, let's say, on some of these data sets that are doing downscaling big statistical models at a, at a certain state or a regional scale to these very small scalar units, which are often quite artificial, right? And again, because there isn't ground truth thing, we're not really sure what's happening. Um, despite that, right, what you see on the ground is an incredible array of informal adaptations, right? That could be things like, you know, moving plantation times by a month to things like giving up planting certain kind of uh, uh, produce because let's say winter snow has reduced to the fact that now you have a lot more uh, springtime pests because there isn't enough winter chilling to the fact that, you know, topsoil often is getting very hurt because, you know, there isn't a snow blanket to protect it from the freezing winter wind. So there, people have figured out a whole bunch of informal adaptations. And I would say the very big lack of formal adaptations in the state has actually been a boon because it has allowed a lot of these small holder families to adapt away from any kind of, um, let's say interventions, which then elites would immediately capture, right? So it's very different from the situation in, in Nepal where there are Lapas and a lot of that local, uh, I would say mobilization has in many ways been captured by the elites. Um, and finally, TED, right? The theory of environmental degradation which essentially, you know, is this environmental determinist idea that the Himalayas, the Himalayas are this very risky, fragile, dangerous place, right? Which, which has been around for 40, 50 years now and is a, is a very problematic idea. And 
it refuses to go away. And I would say in many ways, it's transitioned from environmental determinism to environmental reductionism, where it's really very neatly kind of led into climate reductive thinking about the region where moment you see a flash flood or moment you see a forest fire, the first thing um, a lot of scholars, a lot of media outlets say is that it's climate change, which is a very convenient way of looking past all the structural issues that plague the region, right? So this is, you know, my very short and dirty intro into kind of some of the processes um, that are happening in Uttarakhand and some of the confluences at which the stories that I'm going to tell you now have emerged. So one thing before we go into the stories, there's a lot of moving parts. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's a very complicated set of things that are happening. And so I'm, 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 I'm going to try my best to sort of give you guys a sense of what it is that is going on in the ground. But, you know, in during question and answer, please feel free to ask um, questions about, you know, those stories. So, um, yeah, and so, you know, all that stuff that I just said, this is a bit of a pictorial representation of that. The rural household is kind of grappling. On the left, you have all the actors that are important. And, you know, on the right, you have some of these processes, right? Land use change, elite resource capture, mobility, commercialization. On the left, you have the market, development NGOs, non-human beings, experts, the state outsiders. So the rural, the rural household, right, is caught in this crucible. It's sort of emerging from this crucible of contention where all these forces are vying for its future. So this is kind of like the first big, uh, I would say this is the first story, right? And this is kind of a story with which I want to highlight uh, the anxieties of the ethno-techno state, right? So, you know, what I said about a cursed, fragile, sacred land, right? So I hope with this story, you understand uh, a bit of how climate knowledge is being produced, thought about by people, you know, ac across, uh, a couple different uh, statuses in society across a couple different class, as well as um, uh, educational positions, right? So the two the two conversations that I'm going to go into they happened in January 2017. So uh, before again I get deeper into these stories, apart from this picture, every other picture you see is not a picture of the story. Again. The pictures and the stories don't match. This is all deliberate to sort of obfuscate the people I'm talking about because a lot of the stuff is quite uh, sensitive and I don't want to talk about it in a way which might give some stuff away. So a lot of the pictures that you see are often of people that have migrated out, don't live in Pahar, like in rural areas anymore. But this picture of the GB Pan Institute of Himalayan Environment and Development is very real. This is a real place. I've been there multiple times. And so this was a conversation that I had there with two people, uh, a senior scientist, Rawadji, who is a uh, development, he works with rural development, but he's also a climatologist. Um, again, all names are made up, that's not his real name. All you have to know is that he's an upper caste physical scientist. And the other person is Virji, uh, again, he's an upper caste uh, man, he's part of the village council in this village in uh, Almora, which is one of these districts in Uttarakhand. And he's sort of helping um, Rawadji with his citizen science initiative. He's sort of coordinating it, right? So again, um, the reason I'm going to I'm going to like get into this conversation is to give you a sense of some of the politics behind the climate uh, behind climate knowledge production. Sorry, you're hearing a siren behind me. That's a fire, <laughs> the fire truck in my neighborhood is going off. So apologies for that siren. But um, I will, so this is a conversation that happened over a couple of days, right? And the colors are, you know, they kind of point to who is speaking to who. And as I said before, right, I am an upper caste scientist as well. So. I am part of this process of knowledge production, and I think of it as, as that, right? I'm not some objective scientist on the side. I definitely played a part, and so I am part of these conversations. So 
So this is a conversation that we were having about, you know, what the climate models are predicting for Uttarakhand and for the Himalaya and how we should be thinking about the Anthropocene. And so uh, Rawaji, a scientist, he says to me, as I'm sure you know, both foreign and Indian experts have predicted that climate change will severely impact the already fragile Himalayan region. So we can't just sit around, we have to do something. And so then I ask him, but sir, how are we ground truthing these claims? You were talking earlier about how unreliable the remote sensing data can be in mountain environments. Is the erosion in Virji's village due to climate change or pines on the high elevation slopes? And so then Ravaji kind of turns to me and says, hey, he's sitting right there. Right? Ask him, right? Like, tell, tell him what's happening. Right, what is he, what's he asking? What caused the floods, right? Abda Kimai. So then Virji, this, you know, part of the village council, this upper caste man, you know, wearing his little uh, sheep wool jacket and everything. He kind of like, you know, gets really startled that he's being asked to say anything at all in this conversation. He kind of like wakes up and says, uh, Chakravati ji, you know, I'm ignorant, right? I'm not educated doctors like you both. So <laughs> I think if we cut trees and live unethically, then floods happen, right? This is a result of our sins, right? So, I mean, this conversation sort of goes on. All of this is sort of me. I, I've mined and truncated these conversations. It goes on to talk about Kaliug and the fact that, you know, we've entered an age where we are sinning because, you know, uh, I guess women are going to school and you know, boys are on their phones and people are driving too many cars. And there's a whole litany of things that he's not a fan of, including the fact that there's a more and more Muslims in, in India. Anyway, I didn't get into all that because I, I want to like get some something else out of this conversation. So then uh Rawadji switches to English, right? So that you know V doesn't understand. He says, Do you see how superstition ignorant Pahari people are? How are we supposed to ground through data? I can't even get them to trust in science, right? So this is, you know, like Ravaji says this almost as if I am the dumbass here uh, for asking, you know, for in many ways kind of questioning his authority, saying that, look, I got a different picture from Virji and you're saying something else. And he's like, yeah, okay, Virji, right? How, how can you even put those two uh, let's say, points of view legitimately on the same plane. I have no idea. So it, it was almost like a rebuke to me, right? But then I kind of, you know, carry on just because I'm like, I need to see this through. But sir, when I was in Virji's village last week, the one panchayat said that the hillside erosion has increased in slopes with pine incursion and the stepped fields where older irrigation channels were, you know, untended due to horticulture planting, right? So in a lot of these, in a lot of these, um, villages right because of commercialization there has been this trans you know there's this transformation from doing subsistence towards this commercial orcharding right and in, when that orcharding has happened these traditional irrigation channels right which i guess in you know they exist in himachal they exist in uttarakhand they exist in a whole lot of places they are really critical in 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 many ways distributing water and they do it really well so they've been untended now for years. And because of that, there is this incredible amount of water logging that is happening because these channels are, you know, untended. So I say all this, and then Rawadji says to me, kind of looking really confused, but also a little bit frustrated. He's like, Chakrabati, you tell me one thing, what are you after, right? Because when I contacted him, I was like, you know, sir, I want to talk to you about climate change in Uttarakhand. I want to understand what you guys are doing, what's happening. And so he was actually I would, I'll, I, I'm like ready to bet my professional, uh, you know, career that the only reason he took this interview with me is because I said that I was doing a PhD in a U.S. university, right? That was probably the biggest reason why he wanted to talk to me. But anyway, so now he's very confused about what it is that I'm trying to get out of this conversation, right? If you want to understand village politics, then you need to be in the village. Why are you here? I'm a scientist, right? And there's a long pause during which there's this like real discomfort around the room. I'm not really sure what's happening. And Veer is like looking like, you know, kill me now. Like this is the worst place I could have been. And then he says, look, my work is the development of Pahala. And he kind of says that almost religiously, right? It's like, he's not saying that 
as a matter of fact, he's saying that as a matter of conviction, right? It's like, I believe in this. This is why I'm doing this, right? And then once he says that, you know, there is this like silence in the room. And then Weir like really steps in to kind of break that silence and says, look, Rawatji has really helped us. I mean, without him, we were lost because, you know, on one side, there's this change in seasons. That's what he kind of calls, you know, Ritu Badlav, like, you know, climate change, right? He, he kind of doesn't use the terminology that, let's say, someone like Rawatji would use. And on the other hand, is threat from outsiders, right? And he says, like, you know, this almost like in a low voice. Um, and with his help, we are being able to manage both. And I was, I was really confused at this point. I'm like, outsiders, like who? You mean people from Delhi that are coming to buy your land? And then, you know, Ra the Rawadji at this point is like, God, this guy's like classic dumbass. He knows nothing about anything. I have no idea why I gave him my time. And he just laughs. He says, no, sir, Pakistan and China, they are our neighbors here. So Rawadji is from a military family, like many older Pahadis are. And he kind of, you know, in many ways embodies that geopolitical insecurity and that geopolitical notion of, you know, Pahad is the bulwark, right? We are this, uh, we are the Rajputs. He is Rajput. He is this like warrior caste. We have to protect and save this land from all the outsiders, which in this case are, you know, Chinese and Pakistanis. And like they are our neighbors here, right? And always trying to destroy our nation, break our unity. But we are Rajput. Keeping our land safe is in our blood. So at this point, you know, he's just gone full out nativist on me. He's just like, this guy's, you know, not worth my time. And, you know, he says this in like an almost a finality. Right? There's this like, yeah, we're done here. Get the F out of my office. But, you know, me having all that privilege, knowing that not much could happen to me, you know, up, apart from him being mad at me, I kind of push back and I say, okay, but coming back to climate change, Virji in the village. And so now I'm like, uh, you know, kind of trying to talk to, uh, uh, sorry, Ankita, did you have a question? Please go ahead. Um, Ritodi, could we collect the question? Hello, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah, that's fine, Raul. Okay. So, okay, at this point, I'm just like, all right, well, I'm, I'm talking to, uh, I, I kind of turn to Virgin and I say, you know, when we were in the village, I was in the lower caste area and saw because of the land holding, so the rainwater was draining into their fields and water logging for days. One family said they had lost multiple animals to infections. And then, you know, Virji kind of looks at me at this point, the conversation's honestly over and he's like, Chakrabartiji, if you don't mind, can I tell you something? Look, SC families are very good at crying to the government, to outsiders, it's all so that they can get compensation claims. Floods don't really care about Jatpat, right? So what he's trying to say to me is that, look, this vulnerability that we have, we are sharing it, right? It's not like, you know, lower caste people somehow are more vulnerable than upper caste people, right? Despite what the lower caste family said to me, despite where they are spatially placed, despite, you know, all of that, right? So there is this real dissonance in, you know, what he was saying, like what I heard in the village and what Virji was saying here. So that is, you know, one story, right? That is like this, uh, you know, the scientist, this upper caste man who's trying to help him out. This, this story about climate change, about geopolitical insecurity, the story about, you know, uh, vulnerability sort of not having anything to do with cost. Um, so now we come to the second story, right? The second story is essentially, you know, from Gandhigiri to Baba Ramdev, right? And one of the things that I'm writing more and more about is how upper caste men in Uttarakhand, they're acting as brokers of the neoliberal Hindu nation, right? And this isn't something new. I think a lot of other people are, are looking into this whole thing. Radhika is, I know, uh, Bhumika, uh, Jane and Craig, there's a lot of scholars that are trying to understand how young people are sort of, under, you know, young upper caste people are engaging with Hindutva and the ways in which, you know, the region of Uttarakhand is featuring within the broader Hindutva project. However, 
what I want to show with this story is this engagement between an old, well-known regional, like the head of an old, well-known regional NGO, belonging to a powerful upper caste Marxist leftist family, whom, whom I'll call Dwevediji, a collaborator from the village who works with Dwevediji Negi, um, his son, Suraj, a, a plant scientist from the State University um, that's, you know, a couple of districts away called Bhart, a Bengali refugee uh, who is a small wholesaler in a Terai small town called Samir. Um, and again, like I said to you, right, there were all these Bengalis that were brought to the Terai area and kind of put there. And a lot of their cultural mingling has, has resulted in a really interesting, I would say, you know, constellation of cultural, ethnic, caste positions in that Terai area. And again, like in the last one, you know, conversations were Hindi, uh, Kumauni, and English. In this, it's Kumauni, Hindi, English, and Bengali, right? Because uh, Samir speaks Bengali as well. And so I, I was trying to keep up speaking. I speak more or less all these four languages. So it's just kind of like, you know, understanding what's happening here. But so, all right, th this, this was the thing, right? The thing is that because of the way in which uh, I would say um, corporates in India that give money for development work in the mountains, things were you know going a bit south because of the economic downturn, but also demonetization and all this other stuff that was happening, right? And so the Tata Trust, which often give a lot of money to Pahari NGOs, they were like you know not really, I guess, giving them as much money. And so there was this problem where. Um, Negi, who actually, he is the, I would say he's the, he's sort of the model of the upper caste savior of lower caste people, right? Um, he literally runs all these balwadis and anganwadis, which are like after school programs and for kids, which are often staffed by lower caste women, who he says he needs to hire in order to, you know, um, help give them a career and livelihood and whatnot. But it's his way of giving back to society. That's what he always says to me. But anyway, in this conversation, uh, you know, Dwediji, Negi, and Suraj are kind of going at it in terms of what should we do about this lack of funds and also these new funders that are not showing up, right? So <sighs> Negiji, uh, like this is what Dwedi is saying, Negiji, this time the Tata people won't be helping us that much unless we can bring in the climate change angle. Then there are some people interested, right? That guy from HSBC Bank called me a few times last month, right? So at this point of time, HSBC, this big bank, was trying to kind of go into some of these rural areas in Uttarakhand and just finance just adaptation projects, like really nearly, right? I mean, anyway, that's a whole other talk. That's a whole other conversation. But just to get a sense that there's a lot of corporate, uh, there's a lot of CSR happening in Uttarakhand that is tied to climate change, that is tied to vulnerability reduction, right? And so Negi says, whatever you think is right, I just need some money to keep the after-school centers alive. Just hire maybe two, maybe three of these girls, given their family situations, they don't have a lot of options. And given their family situation here is just a euphemism for saying they're lower caste girls, right? Like, you know, because of, because they're lower caste, they can't do anything because, you know, we are pressing them, he doesn't say that, but that's essentially it. Um, because of your generosity, we have been running this all these years, right? So there is this, you know, there is this sense of, uh, like, you know, he's the patriarch and he's going to help him out and he's he's going to help run these programs. And at this point, uh, Suraj, who is, you know, this young whippersnapper, educated, you know, like, he's all about new stuff and technologies. He's, he's in many ways, he's sort of like a, a, a Pahari version of an eco-modernist, um, he says, sir, what about the Hansa Foundation, right? So the Hansa Foundation is, again, another thing to Google for people who don't know. It's, it's a foundation set up with, by this you know, rich Indian American person who I guess used to, I'm, I'm sure he still is, uh, owns uh, a lot of money in the US. Anyway, uh, there is a lot of stuff there and I, I don't wanna get into it, but just to understand it's a big CSR initiative and, you know, Surat says, these days they're all over the mountains. They seem to have a lot of money. They're supporting the new solar initiatives, right? So at this point of time, there was a lot of this Akshay Uja stuff the state was unrolling, right? So they were like 
give us a bit of your land, we're gonna put some panels and then you can sell that electricity back to the state. Right? And the Hansa Foundation were also sort of trying to support all this and say, look, we are doing alternate energy stuff and whatnot. And so hearing this, you know, <laughs> the the way that she says to, you know, actually says to Negi, doesn't talk to Suraj really, says kids these days, Hansa Foundation, kids these days, right? Like all they care about is fast money. Do you know who is behind Hansa? We can't just take any, mo any money from anybody, right? This isn't a business. So he is like, you know, he has this very ideological bent in him, Dwediji, right? He's like, no, I'm going to take money from Tata, who are a clean, good corporation, not, you know, not like some willy-nilly Hansa Foundation who've, God knows, made their money how, selling arms or something. And he told me many stories about Hansa Foundation, which some of them were true, some were not. But to, you know, kind of give you a sense that th this is a sort of milieu here, right? this is kind of the conversations that are happening. At which point, right, Negi switches to Kumauni um, and says to and and says to his son, "That's right. Shut your mouth. Know nothing about the world, but have a hundred opinions." Terebaski batni, right? Like, and I'm translating in Hindi from uh, I, I'm I've left the Hindi as Hindi. That's the one line he says in Hindi, right? Which kind of maybe to kind of help me understand or help you know. Uh, the way that you understand that he's castigating his son. But anyway, this is sort of like, you know, what, what happens. And then, you know, the way that he comes back and says, look, so like I was saying, think about the climate angle, environmental stuff we're already doing. We just need to show them some projects are also climate change related. Okay, maybe we can keep one after school program going, but that's all I can do for now. So he, he's kind of saying, look, there's this new wave of funding that's coming where people really want to see a climate angle. Right. And if you can't prove that climate angle, I'm not sure we can fund those things. So like poverty reduction or after school programs, they're not there's donor fatigue. Right. They, people don't want to fund this. So this conversation happens in the offices of this NGO. We are now in uh, a, a small. Sorry. Um, Ritoni, yeah, I'll go ahead. Five minutes. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll run through this real fast. So we are now um, in the, you know, in a, a small, small kind of rural urban town near uh, Pantnagar University. This is in the Tarai, and it's me and Negiji and Suraj and Samir, the, the the Bengali wholesale Mundi guy. And so Suraj says, "Yeah, but yeah," addressing me, but for his father's ears, right? So he's, he's telling me, but he's really talking to his father. What do these old men have against making money, right? Look at this thinking, same old projects, same old Gandhi, right? Pahar ka vikas, it's like Bakchodi has up, right? And I've left that in there just because it's untranslatable, right? Bakchodi just means, it's all just bullshit, but it also kind of means, what a load of crap, right? What is all this? Look at Baba Ramdev, right? He is the one making money and helping others. So you see this juxtaposition right here between all that Marxist ide ideology that happens there and then this conversation. And then his dad says, you're gonna teach me, pipsqueak that was born yesterday. Let's hear your amazing idea. People with doctorates and money and class cannot figure it out. Mr. Suraj from Mana village will solve everything. And so Suraj says, yeah, do you wanna listen? Okay, let me call Bhart Bhartji. Bhartji is the plant scientist. Um, all we need is two poly houses and capsicum money and broccoli seeds. Batavia. Onion seeds are selling for 30,000 rupees a kilo. Ask Samir. And that point, Samir kind of like jumps in, says, ha, huh, yeah, these days, broccoli and onion are selling like fireworks. Also, if you can get it certified by someone. And that's when Suraj is like, no shit, that's why I'm talking to this Bharji. Otherwise, why would I waste my time with him? I know how to grow seeds, but I need the certified breeder seeds from him, right? So these certified breeder seeds are basically seeds that a variety of state institutions in India give out to growers, you know, so that they can grow their own seeds, but they're all terminator seeds, right? So three, four generations in, they're all high, high yielding varieties, so they just collapse, right? It all goes away. But anyway, they sell for a lot of money if you can grow uncontaminated breeder seeds. And but yeah, thanks to the winter snow basically disappearing, the poly houses don't break anymore, right? So because of climate change and that snow kind of going away, these poly houses now in which he grows the seeds, they stay intact. And we have the right chilling requirements. Samir is down in the Monday and he let me in. And then Negi goes, yeah, like they'll just let you walk into the Monday, right? Bengalis and Punjabis run that market. 
who are you? Aukat mere. And what's all this broccoli onion? What happened to our agriculture, right? Outsiders from Delhi are taking over. Now even the food and plants, right? It's thanks only to people like Duvedi ji that we have some Pahari culture left, right? I'll, again, I'll, I can discuss this more during the, I, I want to get to the last story, which is essentially, a, 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 this is a lower class story, right? So it's challenging kings, white men, and Thakurs. And this is a conversation that happens in Garhwal with an architect, Bhim, Bhim's son, who runs a illicit sand mining business, Rohit, a Nepali immigrant laborer who manages the apple farms, Nautial, who actually works for Rohit, and a college-educated woman who's married to, um, it's not married to Bhim, is actually married to Rohit, sorry, and the forest department ranger, Pantaji, right? And so conversations in Garwali, Nepali English. So, <sighs> You know, um, Bhim is essentially an architect, right? And so what he's, you know, we're sitting one day and we're talking about houses and, you know, pakka versus old style traditional houses. And, you know, what, what he says to me is that, look, these boys aren't interested in learning about wooden construction. I don't blame them. Accessing the jungle is more difficult every day. Thanks to village headmen, I can still get a few logs out now and then. And then, you know, his son says to me, he has no problem stealing wood, but I move a little sand from the river and I'm the criminal. Look at the way I see it all. All this Jal Jungle Jameen never belonged to us. First there were kings, then the British, and now the Taku and the Forest Department. What has changed for us, right? How can I ruin something that never belonged to me? And so then, you know, Beam is just like, looks at me and says, sir, you tell me, is this how anyone speaks in this Mahal? And this Mahal, right, is this, threat of caste is violence, the sort of like Thakurs, you know, being quite powerful. You don't feel scared, not the Thakurs, but don't you at least fear the gods of the mountain? What gods, Rando? When the Thakurs burned Kishan's house a few years ago for making mistake of buying alcohol from the village liquor shop, where were the gods? Power is all that matters and land. There are more and more stones in the river. Bahia was telling me it's because the ice is melting faster in the summers. Thakus want pakka homes, people in the plains want cement. I'll sell them to both. What's wrong in that? You are just used to gulami, right? Like you're just used to being a slave to these upper caste people. So at that point, I'm just like, I don't, yeah, this conversation is insane. I don't know where it's going. So I just kind of look at Arut's wife, Rupa, and say, what do you think about all this? And then she says, what do I think? That's what you NGO people, you scientists all want to know. There was a lady here last year from Norway asking me all these questions about money, education, about climate change. How has it helped me? What is the difference between me and a cow? Look at my hands, rough like stones. I'm tired of these drunk men fighting every day. So that's, you know, Rupa sort of interjecting between father and son over there. So this is next day, right? And, you know, I'm with Rohit and we are at the forest uh, ranger's office and we are in this back room and everybody's, quite drunk um, other than me. And, you know, this is what Rohit sort of says, Panji sir could please let Nortyal into his house. He needs to work. And Nortyal is the Nepali laborer who tends the apple trees that Rohit's father has. Any troubles, just, you know, let know, okay? Please, Sirji, like, you know, just, he, he, he's trying to tell him, I, I can, you know, grease the wheels here. And so then, you know, uh, Ponzi is like, the, the forest ranger is like, don't they have farms back home in Nepal? Why is he here? You know, he can't be here inside the park boundaries. So their whole village is inside the boundaries of, of a national park. On top of that, he has been working on Manrega Cruz. So then, you know, Rohit trying to kind of ease the situation. He's like, Sergi, he's from across the Kali River. His farm got washed away in the last rains. You know how poor Nepal is. He needs, he needs to do some work and feed his family. He's Hindu, doesn't eat meat. Please, Sarji, my father needs some help with the apple trees. Especially at night, the monkeys are killing us. Tu batana, like he points to Nortial. And Nortial, with his face to the floor, he doesn't look at the ranger. He's like, yes, sir, lots of poverty, sir. I have to feed my kids, sir. I don't touch beef. That Manrega work was a mistake, sir. Big mistake, never happened again. And then Sergi, I guess, finally is play here. He's like, tige, tige. I'm in a good mood today because Chakravati ji is here. <laughs> Come to the office tomorrow morning for some tea and we will see. And tea here is a euphemism for you know what. And Rohit, when will you get me some pheasants? You've become a big Sergi, huh? Forgotten us small people. So Rohit is a Sage because he sells stones, right, to people. Um, Thank you, Sergi. I'll get you some pheasants next week, pakka. 
spring is too hot, right? I don't think they're having many eggs. And this is Rohit telling me, I don't know if there's a connection between, you know, heat and the number of eggs pheasants have, but Rohit seems to think that's true. How about a goat? And then they all laugh. So, you know, I'm sorry we've gone so far, you know, over time, but this is sort of where we are, right? There's, this again is a very artificial construct of, of the Anthropocene, right? The materiality of it and the discourse, right? And as you see, they're both, you know, the connections between both are really well gate kept by upper caste men, right? And this is across, you know, Uttarakhand, many of the places where I've worked, this seems to be the case. Um, and so in some conclusions, you know, preliminary climate society relationships, you see a lot of these talks about surviving Kaliug, right? They're seeing this as this manifestation of, you know, the end of times, especially a lot of these upper caste men. Um, extraction as adaptation, right? So a lot of these, these adaptation ideas that are coming from the state are often set up as, in a very extractive way, which end up then, you know, leading to elite capture and hurting a lot of, um, you know, I would say minorities in these communities who are mostly lower caste. Abusive relationships with global climate science, right? And you see that with that government scientist in, you know, G.B. Punt, where, you know, he is not seen as good a scientist as the IPCC Global North folk, but on the other hand, you know, he has to kind of lord his own knowledge over some of these villagers in Pahar. Adaptation as development, which again is one of those very problematic things where what is the difference, right? If there is no difference, then why are we talking about adaptation? And then finally, this notion that climate change is happening, right? Because this is an age of transformation. Everything is changing. So why shouldn't the climate change? So yeah, I mean, look, this is where I'll leave you. These are some of the these are some of the things that I'm grappling with, where, you know, these are some of the people that I'm reading to sort of understand this further. But what I see definitely in Uttarakhand is a real lack of Dalit ecologies, right? That's what uh, Prasad 2022 talks about. And it's a very powerful frame with which to encounter some of this, right? And a lot of this work is ongoing. And so I'd be happy to hear any questions. Thank you so much. Sorry for going over. Uh,